Professor Gao received his bachelor's degree from Xi'an Jiao Tong University of, of China in 1982, and his master and PhD degrees in um, engineering science from Harvard University in 1984 and 1988, respectively. He served on a faculty of uh, Stanford University between 1988 and 2002, when he was promoted to full professor with tenure in 1994, and uh, 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 um, with tenure in 1994, and, and took full professor in 2000. He served as the director of the Max Planck Institute for Metals Research between 2001 and 2006, and before joining the faculty of Brown University in 2006. At present, he is the Walter mm, Annenberg Professor of Engineering at Brown. And Professor Gao's interest focused on understanding of basic principles that control mechanical properties and behaviors of materials in both engineering and biological systems. He has been elected to National Academy of Engineering, um, German National Academy of Science, and Chinese Ac um, Academy of Sciences. And he is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Mechanics and Physics Solids, the leading journal of his field. He has received numerous academic uh, awards from uh, John Simon um, Guggenheim Fellowship in 1995 and to recent to the R um, Rodney Hill Prize in Solid Mechanics from the International Union of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics in 2012, and Praga Medal from Society of Engineering Science in 2015, Nada Medal from American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 2015, and the Theodore Von Kamen Medal from American Society of Civil Engineers in 2017. So let's welcome uh, Professor Gao. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Can you hear me? Is this is working. Okay. Thank you, Tin, for your kind introduction, and uh, thank you all for having me here, giving this prestigious, prestigious lecture. It's my great honor to uh, uh, to share with some of you some uh, of our, some of the work in my group on uh, nanomaterial cell interactions. So let me first acknowledge. Uh, a, Couple of uh, grad, two graduate students, one postdoc in my group, who who did actually the work. <laughs> so, right? and I, I I also benefit with a lot of uh, faculty collaborators. So Bob Hurd, he's a chemical engineer. I've been working him for over a decade. Professor Agnes King from Brown Medical School, and uh, Professor Malonakis from Brown Medical School. Professor Petra uh, Vlahovska, she actually used to be a Brown. She moved to a Northwestern University this year. Right, and also uh, uh, two faculty from Harvard Medical School. Right. So, so my, uh, I've been working in this field for, uh, for the last decade. Basic idea was looking at the mechanical aspect of how nanomaterial interact with cell. Of course, there's a huge chemical aspect as well, right? The redox, the reactions. So, but th those aspects I'm not addressing today. I'm addressing from a mechanical engineering point of view today. Okay, so the kind of problem I, I am interested in so-called mechanics of cell nanomaterial interactions. So here's a, a couple of review papers we wrote in the last couple of years. Most of were interested in how a cell, uh, especially cell membrane, interacts with nanoparticles of various geometry, such as a sphere, or a, a cube, or a tube, fiber, or a soft or stiff pads, right? These are called one-dimensional nanomaterial or two-dimensional nanomaterial, or sometimes this is called zero dimension, right? Also the surface chemistry sometimes come in, but not always, okay? So also we're interested, if this nanomaterial get into cell, okay, what are the destiny? How does the material interact with intracellular vesicles, such as the lysosome, right? How, what are the biological consequences, their biological effects? So here, here's, some, uh, here's uh, some summary. Cell optic pathways of nanomaterial with different geometrical properties such as size, shape, orientation, mechanical properties such as stiffness, or chemical properties such as surface functionalization. So how do these different properties influence the cell optic pathways of the nanomaterials? Second of all, the cellular intracellular packaging of nanomaterials. So after the nanomaterial get into cell, right, they have a, uh, so packaging issues. So how they were gonna go right, in, in, into the cell? What are the consequences? Toxicity damage of nanomaterial to cells and membranes, right? So, th so these are the issues we're, we're, we're interested. 
let me show you a few backgrounds, okay? Well, why, the, what is the driving force? What is the background motivation for this type of work? The first uh, uh, background I mentioned is so-called nanotoxicology. Essentially, this is an emerging field, in a, especially in the last, grow a lot in the last, uh, last decade or so, since the National Nanotechnology Initiative by President Clinton initiated. This was almost 20 years ago now. So essentially addressing the biological and environmental impact of nanomaterials, huge field, right? There's people from different fields can all contribute understanding, right? But there's a need because the engineer nanomaterials, right? So these are not a result of natural evolution, but because uh, we, we, we made them in the laboratory or we fabricate them, they are becoming a significant fraction of material flow in the global economy, right? It is estimated about majority of them, okay, this is like a, a estimate a few years ago, right? 100,000 tons of this nanomaterial, most of them will end up in landfill, right? They will end up in environment. And no one knows their long-term consequences, so there's a need to know how they influence the biological world, right? The environmental ecology. <clears throat> uh, two specific examples, like carbon nanotube, right? Carbon nanotube production exceeded uh, uh, several thousand tons per year in 2013. These are really man-made nanomaterial who are chemically very stable, ultra-stable. They're not easily degraded by enzyme, biological enzymes. So they will be there for, for, for a long time. And there are being uh, many applications, are being used in many applications such as energy storage, automotive parts, boat hauls, right, sporting goods, water filter, thin film electronics, coatings, actuator, lots of applications of these materials. This is booming nanotechnology. And uh, so a lot of this material will eventually end up in environment, right? So, so what are the effect on, on our life, on, the, on our species, not so clear. And graphene is a, is a newer, even newer nanomaterial. Graphene was around 15 tons annual production in 2009, and five years later, is grown by a factor of 10, right? Today is even much higher, right? So all this just shows a rapid growth of nanotechnology, nanofabricated material. Their environmental, biological impact are unclear at this moment. Okay, another motivation for uh, the study, uh, for this type of study is called nanomedicine. Okay, a lot of people using nanoparticles, nanotechnology, for diagnosing cancers and treating cancers. It's a lot of people, right? So I'm giving a, an example of, uh, of uh, antibiotic, right? How this nanometer can also be used for the benefit of uh, 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 addressing bacteria issues. As we know, since 1940s, right? Since the emergence of penicillin and the various antibiotics, this has made a huge difference in the quality of life, right? A lot of uh, today's population, a large fraction exist because of the antibiotic. This is a big advance in medicine. However, bacteria also be evolving. So there's a war between the human development and various antibiotic and uh, the evolution in the biological world, right? They keep getting new species evolving, mutations and things. And currently, okay, the looming crisis means the human pace of development, innovation has not been able to keep up the pace with the emergence of new bacteria, right? In fact, the World Health Organization issued the, the uh, crisis, the warning. The, the, uh, uh, the most recent release was a year ago, February 27, 2017. They identified a couple bacteria in a critical stage, wider critical. Uh, this uh, antibiotic called carbapenium. Carbapenium is the last resort, okay? It's not prescribed usually for antibiotics. It's only for the last resort. If everything else fails, okay? <laughs> it's a, so these emerging uh, couple of bacteria become resistant to carbapenium. That means we have no cure for them if they, if they break out, all right? So the challenges here in this field is the development of a new antibiotic has not been able to keep up with the pace of antibiotic resistance. Okay, most existing antibiotic targets the protein or cell wall or DNA synthesis pathways. They do not work on non-growing bacteria, right? 
right? If the bacteria, they call persisters, some of the bacteria stop synthesizing, they become uh, sleeping, right? they, they go into sleep. So the current antibiotic have no effect on them. Okay. So the potential solution to this is two questions. Can we use modeling simulation to speed up the pace of drug innovation discovery? Right? First, we need to speed up the innovation pace. Second, can we seek membrane-active antibiotics that kill persisters? Because uh, these persisters, they're, they're not synthesizing, so traditional antibiotics on the market, they target some synthesis pathway, they do not work. Right? Can we develop such things? So one of my uh, topic today is, uh, is I'll give examples of of this application. Okay, another background is the rapid advance in bioimaging. Okay, you know, traditionally, optical microscopy is the prime tool in using medical school, right? Well, material science, we use electron microscopy. But electron microscopy uh, do not work on live cell. You have to kill the cells, right? You have to stay dead materials, which is a big disadvantage. So optical microscopy, the res resolution is limited to optical wavelengths. So in the last 20 years, last two decades, there are various near field scanning microscopy and other uh, uh, fluorescence techniques emerged. So to bring the dimension, the, uh, the lens dimension, into nanoscale. In fact, 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to three scientists, Eric Betzig, uh, Moner and Stephen Hell for development super resolved fluorescence microscopy, which brings optical micro into nano dimension. So many of the things uh, we can only speculate maybe a decade ago can today be visualized. This is one example, okay, showing the philopodia is a structure on a cell membrane. Philopodia, okay, it's called cell pseudo legs of cells, play important role in the cell migration. You can see these structures are typically uh, 100 nanometer or even thinner. But this movie actually is not ele electron microscopy, it's optical microscopy, showing nanostructure evolution. This is only possible, right, this is a, a paper from a paper in, published in Science in 2014. So not even possible five years ago, but today, using this highly resolved optical microscopy, you can begin to study right, the uh, mechanical aspect of nanostructures in drug with the cell. Okay, uh, in a limited time, I thought today this is a huge field, so I'm, I'm just select three problems to share with you. Selected problem in mechanics of cell nanomaterial interaction. Uh, first problem, uh, first class of problem, I, I say morphology. Okay, uh, this is an area where we question the mechanics of cell entry of a 1D nanomaterial. I'm going to just give you an example here. Uh, second problem I'm sharing with you is called packaging. Okay, how a nanoscale material is packaged in the intracellular vesicle. So this has to do with cytotoxicity of a flexible uh, nanofiber. Uh, third problem I'm sharing with you is the membrane-active antibiotic. There we do energy mapping, showing how physical science can help. This is really a biological problem, but uh, I'm just giving an example how physical science is helping us uh, understanding the mechanism by mapping the energy evolution as this nanomaterial interact with cell membrane. Okay, so the first problem, I'm showing a little bit of math mathematics, so only, only two slides. Okay, so bear with me. Uh, so here, for example, I'm just giving you the example. Suppose we want to know how a fiber, right, how nanofiber, like, such as carbon nanotube intercells, so uh, we can use a physical science approach by writing down the free energy of interaction of the two objects. One is a cell membrane, as I drawn here. One is a nanofiber, okay, which is intercell the angle theta. Theta is orientation, okay. So there, the free energy, we we have two terms. The free energy consists of first term is the bending energy, deformation energy, because they in order to bring this nanomaterial inside the cell. The cell membrane has to bend, curved around this nano object. Right? There's a deformation energy. So here, the curvature edge is the mean curvature of this uh, membrane. Kappa is called bending rigidity of the membrane. Right? 
So this term is the uh, represent the deformation energy of the membrane. The second term is the membrane tension energy. So the membrane subjects some tension is uh, uh, is maintained by the cell. Okay, and because the nanomaterial stick of nanomaterial change the area, can change the membrane surface area. So that has a tension energy. Oh, anyway, so you're looking for the minimum energy configuration of these two objects, assembly of these two objects. All right. It turns out this problem is governed by a single parameter. Okay, this parameter is a non-dimensional parameter. It's called normalized tension. Okay, it's defined as the real membrane tension times the square of the diameter of the fiber divided by the bending rigidity. Okay, single dimensionless parameter. Okay, that parameter is given, you know the behavior, you know what is the minimum energy configuration. It turns out the critical number is this two pi over five. All right. If this dimensionless number is bigger than two pi, which is 1.26, if the mem normalized membrane tension is bigger than this number, then the minimum energy configuration is this shown here. Okay, having this fiber just like a tree, like a tree planted on the ground, right? This is the minimum energy, okay? The nanomaterial would like to stick perpendicular to the cell membrane, right? Another case is as soon as the normalized membrane tension is bigger than this number, 1.26, then the favorable energy configuration we call parallel adhering is having this nanomaterial just fall down, this tree just fall down uh, on the ground, right? With a very shallow angle. Okay, this is very simple. The conclusion is very simple. So I'm not going to go into the depths of ma mathematics, right? But it's just simple. So here's a two example of free energy evolving. Okay, so here shows one example is a normalized tension equal to one, which is in a subcritical range, right? So here I'm, pl I'm plotting the red is the bending energy, the first term, the membrane bending energy, how the bending energy change with the entry angle. With the, with the orientation of this nanomaterial, which shows clearly shows the bending energy is minimized at the 90 degree, right? When this uh, is normal to the cell membrane. The tension energy is showing the blue curve, right? The tension energy prefers a shallow angle, not 90 degree. So actually, the energy increase. But total energy, the net, if you add these two terms together, the bending energy dominates. So this is total energy, the black curve, okay? so. A, a total energy f favors this mode, perpendicular entry mode. For, on the other hand, we give this normalized tension equal to three, which is a supercritical case, right, which is this case. You see the bending energy still prefers 90 degree entry, but tension energy become more stronger, so they dominate total energy. Okay, total energy now prefers the parallel adhering mode. And there's, there's a lot of the math, math de details I'm skipping here, but let me give you a, a, a simple explanation, right? How does he, using the, the mathematical geometry. Okay, to understand why there's a perpendicular mode, or interaction mode, in, when the normalized tension is smaller than this uh, 1.26 critical number, consider the bending energy. Okay, bending energy of a membrane deformation is given by uh, the bending rigidity of the membrane times the mean curvature. Okay, mean curvature. Okay, if you are still remember the calculus, the, 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 the analytical geometry in your college, right? The class, there's a special uh, mathematical surface called catenoid. Catenoid is given by this surface here. Okay, it's drawn exactly this shape. Guys, okay, I draw here in this figure. This is sh shape of the membrane is called catenoid. Okay, catenoid is a very famous curve, soap bubble related to and things. This curve. This mathematical curve has two principal curve. Every point has two principal curvature, kappa one and two. They're equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, which means if I have, have a mathematical surface like this, then any point along the surface have zero mean curvature, right? Because a biological membrane, the deformation energy is proportional to the mean curvature of the surface. So in other words, this curve of the membrane have zero deformation energy. Okay, even though it's curved, it's highly deformed, looks like deformed, but actually have zero deformation energy, right? This is a attractor existing in nature, right? So provided a perfect mechanism for our cell to take in food, nutrition, it has this special shape. You can curve it in 
so the food and everything can be transported in and out of cell without causing too much deformation energy. Okay, this is an attractive state. Okay, but unfortunately, this profile dominates only when tension is not too big, okay, below a critical normalized tension. If tension is, is sufficiently big in a supercritical stage, then tension energy dominates. Tension energy is proportional to the increase in membrane area, right, as a result of uh, uh, sticking a, a, a fiber into the cell membrane, which is prefers a shallow, a parallel adherent load. All right. So anyway, okay. So so that's why our food, our food particle is always break down our body, our stomach, right? Our body process and break down food particle nanoscale, so that we have this this mode. So cell can absorb all the nanoparticle, nanomaterial through this channel by deform itself into catenoid, so it can receive this material at a low cost, a zero cost in deformation energy, right? But if the material is big, if the nanofiber is big, then it actually can evade this pathway and become a parallel adherent. So here's uh, some experiment, experimental evidence. Okay, so, uh, sorry, and let me just say one, 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 one word here. So this condition, Right when uh, sigma smaller than sigma c, right when the normalized tension is smaller than this one, can, is equivalent to say a critical size effect. If the nanofiber, if the fiber is smaller than ac, right, where ac is given by this square root of five membrane tension divided by pi times bending rigidity, which is, this is about a, a length scale of a 40 to 150 nanometer, depends on the cell type. Depend on cell type, right? It can vary. So the critical dimension. So this critical uh, state is also equivalent to a critical size for the fiber, right? If the fiber is thin enough, if the nanofiber, really nanofiber, if the radius of the fiber is smaller than this critical number, then it prefers the normal perpendicular entry. If it's big fiber, then it prefers to lie down. Okay. So this is what I'm going to interpret. So experimentally. We uh, did experiments on my collaborators. Okay, we feed the cell into various nanomaterial with different chemistry. So here show the micrograph shows the carbon nanotube. Okay, the carbon, when, when A is, uh, we, we, we consider small enough fibers, small enough radius. So here shows a carbon nanotube, right? And uh, so you can consider they're nearly perpendicular. This is a scanning electron microscopy, <laughs> okay. Showing these nano uh, tubes are standing perpendicular to cell surface, as we expected from theory. Right? And uh, uh, when our paper was submitted, the reviewer was saying, "You, you got to check. This is not a chemistry effect." Right? So we changed the gold nanowire. Okay, here is actually a bundle of two gold nanowire, but still thin. Okay, you can see it's a normal perpendicular to cell surface. Asbestos fiber of completely different chemistry from gold and carbon also stand in perpendicular to the cell membrane. Okay, now for bigger bundles, okay, we we, we find that when a fiber bundle together, you form a large enough bundles, and when they exceed the critical size, then they fall down, they lie down on the cell surface. Okay, so one D nanomaterial, for example, CNT's nanowires asbestos fibers intercellular tip first perpendicular entry mode as predicted by our theory. And fiber bundles adopt the horizontal mode of interaction. This is kind of consistent with our, uh, what theory predicts. But ideal experiment, ideally, if you, we can design experiment, we should have a growing fiber. It, it, the, the, <laughs> the fiber growing diameter. Our theory predicts initially the fiber would, would uh, stick perpendicular. Now it will lie down at a critical size. But unfortunately, we couldn't do that experiments. So we, we took a look at this. Again, it's philopodia. Philopodia. Philopodia is like a growing fiber. It's not, except this except philopodia protr protruding out of the cell membrane instead of uh, going from outside in to in, right? In, in, instead of entering cell, actually it's uh, poking out of the cell. But the free energy function is the same. Okay, if you write down the free energy function for two problems, even though they're physically different problems, but they're mathematically they're analogous to each other. Okay, the philopodia are considered these protruding microtubular proteins, right? You can see this this paper it was uh, uh, 15 years ago. 
showing how philopodia, uh, the form, forming process of philopodia, have this uh, microtubular protruding out, and then they merge together, right? So it's like a, it's like a, 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 a fiber protruding out of a cell membrane, and that fiber is growing, right? But before, nobody was able to explain why philopodia, the size is always limited. They don't grow too big. Okay, philopodia grow to be like 100 nanometer or so, then they stop. You know, it's pretty stable, right? Right. So here's a here's a movie I showed already. Okay, if you look at they do transition, right? They do, uh, they do actually, right? You can see they actually fall down. They have the transition between standing up and lying down. Okay. So uh, again, our theory indicates the 1D protruding nanostructure cells. They should become unstable at a critical condition, which is given by this critical diameter. So, so, so this movie combined with this explains why these fibers are unstable, right? These fiber structures, philopodia, they, initially they want to protruding out, right? But then when they grow thick enough, they, they lose their mechanical stability. Okay. Okay, so of course we can also, uh, we have a theory, we can also check by simulation, because these days computer simulation becomes so powerful we can conduct simulation to check this prediction. So in one simulation, here, here's a molecular dynamic simulation. We have a cell membrane uh, with receptor molecules interact with, with carbon nanotube. In one case, we pick the membrane tension, normalized tension to be subcritical. Okay, in this case, we see, we, we give it the initial condition is the fiber is oriented at uh, some angle with respect to the membrane. We see that the interaction, the physics, Okay, just the physical force alone. There's no biological motor or anything in this uh, model, right? The fiber is spontaneously oriented to the normal perpendicular to the membrane. If you take a supercritical case, right, normalized tension is bigger than critical, then they actually lie down, right? So, so here's, a, here's a movie I show in a, in a subcritical case. We try to explain, okay? So we try to explain this experimental observation for various type of nanomaterial they tend to stand perpendicular, right? So in, in, this, in this simulation, we randomly orient a fiber with respect to cell membrane. We show by so biophysical uh, uh, energy, just purely physical forces, the membranes spontaneously orient them. Again, this is because of catenoid, right? The, the biological membrane prefer in this catenoid configuration, which is the minimum energy, minimum deformation energy. Okay, so uh, let me show you a little bit uh, uh, connection to disease. Okay, for many years it's known asbestos nanofibers, asbestos fiber, they cause, uh, they cause lung cancer, right? Because asbestos was used a lot uh, last century like for construction material. They're cheap, they're fireproof, they're, they can use insulation, they have very good insulation. But today we don't use them anymore. Most of the manufacturers, asbestos, have become bankrupt because of lawsuits, right? So this connection is known. They are connected to disease. But why? The mechanism, the mechanistic origin is not understood. So our model shed some light, right? So we said there's a critical dimension, okay? If you make the fibers thin enough in a nanoscale, nanofibers uh, lower than this critical size range, then the cell cannot distinguish a, a fiber from a particle, okay? The cell only identify the tip of the fiber, the thing is a nanoparticle. So the cell try to take it in, okay, without worrying how long it is. Now imagine the fiber is very long, right? The fiber is actually very long, right? So you get it in this state, right? This is a famous paper published in 10 years ago, nano, Nature Nanotechnology. This is actually not asbestos fiber, this is a carbon nanotube. Here's an immune cell, okay, immune cell. So you can, you can think what, what is happening, right? Because of this, this important size scale exists in nature, cell interact with, this, with a 1D nanomaterial only with its tip if the, if the fiber is thin enough because it's catenoid, right? Try to take it in. Actually, immune cell is trying to kill it. It's trying to remove it out of our body, right? But this is a huge fiber, right? This is uh, like you're eating a lollipop, which is longer than you. <laughs> so so you, get into tr you get into trouble, right? So cells overeating, so cells get into trouble. When the immune cell 
get into stuck like this is called frustrated endocytosis or frustrated phagocytosis. The immune cell, what it does is the immune cell will call for help. Right? You activate your inflammatory mechanism uh, cause a permanent inflammation in part of your body. Many years later, evolve into many, phys many health issues. Okay, so this is like a police try to arrest a criminal, but a criminal turned out to be too strong, <laughs> right? So the police call, constantly call for help. For an enemy that shouldn't, couldn't be killed, so you, you get lots of problems. Your, your, your body turned into an agitated state for years. Okay, uh, and so no surprisingly, so this paper studied carbon nanotube, which is totally different chemistry from asbestos fiber. But the pathologic, the, 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 the phenomenological, uh, concept, biological concept is very similar. Okay, so their conclusion exposing methothelial lining of mice to long multiple carbon nanotube results in asbestos-like lens-dependent pathogenic behavior. All right, that's their main conclusion. So it doesn't matter. It's not a chemistry-driven, it's actually a mechanics-driven phenomena. If it's long and stiff, and you have this uh, toxicity, right? Because it's a you, the material, the geometry of the material is such that your immune system have not learned how to deal with that, okay? So the second problem I'm gonna share with you is the packaging issue, okay? Imagine a, a nanomaterial such as a carbon nanotube intercell Okay, so where do they go? Okay, they go to this important compartment called lysosome. Lysosome is an intracellular vesicle which is responsible for digestion. Okay, our food particle taken to the cell and end up lysosome being digested. Lysosome is a highly acidic environment, contain many, many enzymes. Okay, it, 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 it's digestion, degradation, autophagy, metabolism is very critical. The size of lysosome range from 0.1 to 1.2 micrometer. It's a highly regulated by cell, right? So, so we are trying to address when a fiber is a problem, because a sphere is no problem. Right? It's known that if you just feed the cell with a sphere, uh, a spherical gold nanoparticle, no toxicity. But if you, if, you, if you feed them with a lung fiber, then it's a problem arises. So where, where's the critical transition? How big is, is big? Right? How, how big is the toxicity starts? So that's a question we, we, we address. Here's the, the key uh, engineering issue we identify as the so-called biosoft and biostiff. So what is biosoft? Biosoft we define as the following picture shows, the following movie shows. If the nanomaterial is long, slender, and uh, compliant, flexible, then this vesicle right, is trying to wrap it around. So it caused, because there's a pinch force, okay, the biological vesicle can apply a pinch force on, the, on this uh, confined nanomaterial. If nanomaterial buckles and just nicely package inside the cell, we call it a biosoft. Okay, that means it's in a, a biological system, it can be right, nicely pack, packaged. Okay. And so this pinch force is about 20 piconewton, right? So we identify. Now, What's a biostiff? Biostiff, if you feed a cell with a long and stiff nanofibers, okay? You can see this, this, this membrane cannot fight against this. This is too rigid, too stiff. It doesn't buckle anymore, okay? It, it doesn't yield. So instead, you have a, uh, the membrane form a tether around, deform around this, this fiber, form a, form a tether, okay? Form a membrane tether. So you have a, so you have a, Persistent contact here and here, right? It's like you have a pinch for persistent contact. That persistent contact causes problem, okay? As I will show you here with carbon nanotube. Right. Because of this fibrous material have a high density, high atomic density, okay? They're, 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 this material have a high density of atoms here. They have a strong interaction with lipid membranes. Uh, if you have a persistent contact of a nano material, nanofiber, with the membrane, you can extract lipids, cause lipid molecules to be extracted along the wall of these fibers. That cause, make the, this uh, lysosome permeable, make them uh, pores, uh, create pores in the membrane, right? So, uh, so, the, so, 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 anyway, so the conclusion here is the persistent contact leads to local membrane damage due to lipid extraction. Right? 
So we published a paper a couple years ago on this one too. Now we wanted to uh, do experiment. We did exper my co collaborator again. We did experiments to verify this. Okay. Again here we choose a material with the same chemistry. We choose carbon. Okay. Same chemistry. All the materials, but with various geometry. Okay. For example, here shows one micrometer long stiff multi-wall carbon nanotube. Okay. In this case, we, we see that here's a lysosome. We see this fiber is long, right? Cannot be deformed by lysosome, actually sticking out, just as we our model shows. Okay. This this, this fiber is pr pr protruding out, the membrane deformed uh, uh, around it. Okay. Uh, so here, here shows carbon black. Same chemistry. Carbon black is like very small particles, okay? And they become nicely packaged. 0.5 half micrometer stiff, same stiffness, but it's short. It's also become nicely packaged within the lysosome. Along a soft carbon, like these are, these are, these are with only a few walls, so the nanotube is flexible, right? You can see it's flexible tube are being bent, okay, being nicely packaged and bent and packaged within lysosome. It doesn't cause this kind of issue. And tangled, soft, multi-wall carbon nanotube, even, even more flexible ones, there's no problem. And carbon nano horns, these materials like a horn, right? They have sharp corners, but they're pretty short, small in dimension, they have no problems. Okay, so the short story is we only find this case toxic. Same chemistry, right? For this case, you, the, the, the lysosome is not capable of packaging them completely this can cause problem. And this is our definition, bio-stiff. All the other one, we call them bio-soft. Okay, so, so our experiments, so we further verify this, uh, the permeability. So we tag on an important protein that's usually contained within the lysosome. It's called catapsin B. Okay, catapsin B is an important protein that's normally within the lysosome. It doesn't permeable. If the catapsin B is released into cytoplasm, the cell dies. Okay, it's the trigger of apoptosis. It's a very famous pro uh, signal, upstream signal that causes cell death. Okay, so we uh, we uh, feed different uh, carbon nanotube, carbon material here. We find only in this case stiff multi-wall carbon nanotube involve cause substantial release of catapsin B. Okay, this is a clear evidence that lysosome become permeable. A lot of things being leaked out into cytoplasm. Okay, here's a, a number of cells with catapsin B release shows this uh, long and stiff multi-wall carbon nanotube show a dose-dependent release of catapsin B. The more such nanotube you have, the more catapsin B is being released into the cytoplasm. Okay, just our theory predicts, right? You have the persistent contact, the damage, the uh, damage cell membrane causing the leaking cause the leaking, and then we can correlate with cell deaths. Okay, we can correlate the catapsin B release to cell deaths. Okay, so we uh, monitor the catapsin B release, then we also monitor how, how many uh, cells are surviving, a surviving cell. Okay, we count down with 24 hours later, how many cells are surviving. Okay, so here shows the dose-dependent survivability. Okay, for uh, for example, here I'm show you flexible for the flexible carbon uh, carbon nanotube. Uh, so basically surviving, right? Basically everybody is surviving. The only exception of a uh, substantial cell death is this red curve and this green curve. So remember, the green curve is the one micron carbon nanotube shown in this picture, right? So this red curve is even longer. Okay, red red curve is even longer. It's more than one micron long, so called cell death. Okay. So this again correlates the ge geometric interaction, the packaging interactions to the cell death. Okay, so based on this insight, based on insight, we draw a, a phase diagram, cytotoxicity phase diagram. Okay, phase diagram. Here, we plot two parameters. Vertical axis is the length of the fiber. Horizontal axis is the diameter of the fiber. Here's the effective diameter, because uh, uh, this nanotube is multi wall There's an inner uh, hole and outer surface, right? Uh, effective means we're going to condense into solid fiber. What's the effective diameter? This curve is the buckling criteria, okay? So this, this uh, uh, what is the, uh, the critical condition for this fiber to buckle, okay, undergo, under this 20 picosecond pinching force, 
Okay. So we did lots of experiments. So each of these data represent experimental uh, measurement. Okay. Red means they're toxic. Cells are dying yeah, from the viability assay. Cells are dying. Blue means the cells are surviving. They're non-toxic. Okay. So in this range, this range, this red, this between this buckling and the, and the a critical lens, this lens is given by basically lysosome size. Okay, lysosome size is about one micrometer. And within the, with, bounded in this range, range when the uh, lens of nanotube is bigger than one micrometer, but they're stiff, it's in this range. Okay, so we did a lot of experiments showing they're all toxic. In this upper corner, they're flexible. Okay, they're, they, this range are slender fibers, they're flexible, they're packaged, they're non-toxic. Okay, there are two data here. Okay, and, and, uh, and here, okay, in this range, the fibers are short, right? They're smaller than, lengths of the fiber are smaller than one micrometer. They can be well, uh, well uh, packaged, okay, because you don't have persistent contact. There are thermal fluctuation, the statistical fl the fluctuation, right? The thermal forces would cause this fiber to basically uh, doing Brownian motion within the cell membrane. So you don't have persistent contact. You don't, if you don't have persistent contact, it's no problem. You don't get the kind of a lipid extraction. So it, it's easy to understand in this range, they're non-toxic, right? Including the little particles, sphere, spherical particles, they're non-toxic. So this is a cytotoxicity uh, phase diagram we proposed. Okay, so my last example is I'm gonna uh, talk about briefly about energy mapping, okay? So here, the challenge is to develop, try to uh, help our medical school colleagues to develop membrane-active antibiotic. Okay, the ch critical challenge here is this antibiotic molecules, whatever you, you, you select, has to be non-tox to human and animal cell. Has to be specifically talking about bacterial membrane. Okay, so there's a lot of choices, right? For example, take a nanoparticle, the dimensionality, whether you take a 1D or take a, a, a sheet or take a particle or take a, 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 a tetrahedra, there's many choices. Uh, in terms of a shape and size, right? How big should it be? Polarity, whether you put the electron, uh, you put the polar groups or non-polar groups and stiffness, right? How stiff these particles? There's a range of choices. So a lot of physical question you can you can pose each of these physical dimension and parameter uh, property will influence how they interact, how the nanoparticle interact with bacterial membrane. Okay, I'm gonna show you some uh, really simple experiments showing their specificity. Okay, so here I'm showing three different molecules. Okay, they are chemical from, they're all 2D sheets, sheet-like particles. Okay, I have these benzene rings. We put them in interact with the vesicle, right? In the first case, in this case, the membrane stay intact, right? Not much damage. Okay, not, uh, so the, the cell membrane is completely okay. In this case, okay, slight change, O to OH, we see the membrane has been damaged. There's a segregation uh, and a poor, poor formation on the cell membrane. In this case, I, let me play this again. In this case, actually, even more extreme, right? We start with the membrane, then we have a huge aggregation here, then the membrane burst. Okay, the membrane burst. So that means our nature bacteria, the membranes, actually very sensitive to all these physical parameters. Okay, yet we don't do not understand. We do not understand fully how each physical parameter influences this. Right. So that's why it's important to study the uh, to map out the energy of the interactions. So there we use a, a, a methodology that's been widely used in the chemical engineering and biochemical engineering, looking at how molecular interactions, it's called steered molecular dynamics, okay, looking at how a molecule in the process of uh, going to cell membrane, how the free energy change, okay, essentially you, 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 map, out, uh, you map out the energy evolution as this particle go into, go into the membrane. Go into the, so I'm not going to go into detail here, uh, given the limited time. But here's uh, our calculated uh, free energy evolution, okay? As a distance from a bilayer center, from a center bilayer, okay? So take an example of adipoline. Adipoline is this uh, molecule, the first one. Adipoline is this case. 
Okay, adipolin, in this case, we see that it doesn't have much effect on cell membrane. It doesn't have much effect. Okay, so here that corresponds to this green curve, this green, light green curve, right, adipolin. You can see that as you bring this molecule toward the cell membrane, the energy is increasing, right? So there's a strong resistance, a strong barrier to penetration. This, this particle actually doesn't easily penetrate into cell membrane. Take a CD437. CD437 is a second molecule that causes substantial change in structure, in the, the membrane structure, causes this aggregation, the membrane aggregation, okay? Make them poor, make them leaking. And in this case, we see that there's a small, as you bring to the cell center, a small energy barrier, but then there's a big energy well here. Okay, there's a strong motivation for this molecule to be in, inside the membrane, right? This red curve is the one I showed cell burst. Okay, in this molecule, you can see initial cause of aggregation, then it caused the burst, the, the whole cell, the whole mem membrane just, just uh, ruptured. Okay, in this case, correspond the red curve. There's a huge energy well, right? That means there's a high density molecule would rush into the cell membrane. Oh, it's the membrane interior. Okay, so, so, so here's some simulation. Okay, in this case, NTZ, uh, let, me, let me show you the movie here. Okay, so, so this is the red curve. Okay, simulation of a molecule interacting, molecular dynamic simulation of interact with cell membrane. This is ex corresponding experiments. You, you can see eventually the, the uh, the molecule will get into the uh, interior. And uh, the, okay, the middle one is the CD437, CD437, right? So have this blue curve, it goes in the cell membrane. Okay, both of them actually get into the cell membrane. In this case, you have this uh, segregation, okay, uh, causing, causing uh, permeable. And uh, the adipolin is the, is the green one, corresponding energy curve. Okay, this one, there's a huge energy barrier to penetrate into cell membrane. You can see this one actually doesn't go into the membrane, so the membrane stay intact. Okay, just slight, slight change in chemical. Remember, these two molecules uh, deviates only by a hydrogen root, <laughs> okay, a, a proton. A very tiny difference in our chemical structure have a huge difference in our interaction with cell membrane. Okay, so we, uh, we've been interacting with our uh, biochemical colleagues from, a, from medical school, Brown Harvard Medical School. So we test these two molecules as new membrane active antibiotic. Right? So this, this was reported in the Nature paper uh, a, a few months ago. Right? We show three things. Okay? We show these two molecules indeed, they're fast killing on persisters. Per, remember, persisters, they're not synthesizing anything. They're sleeping bacteria. Right? The only way to kill them, because they're not there's, there, there, there's no synthesis pathway. They're not making anything, right? So traditional drug doesn't work. But we say that these new molecules do kill them uh, rapidly, right? Give enough dose. They have a low human toxicity, right? They have low resistance probability, right? Remember, we're comparing with a drug on the market, Cipro, right? So the, 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 the traditional drug develop resistance, substantially, this is 100 days of experiments along uh, uh, lung experiments, right? The traditionally drug on the market develop resistance, show resistance after two weeks. Okay, after two weeks, you get bacteria, bacteria become resistant, right? Become resistant. This drug, you have to constantly raise your, your dosage to be effective. Now, uh, this, because these drugs uh, are targeted on the membrane directly, right? So f within 100 days, there's no indication of a, a substantial resistance. Okay, anyway, so this is the beginning of this work in this area. So there's a lot to be done. So I think uh, maybe there's an emergence of a simulation-based platform to see, speed up drug discovery and optimization. Because currently, most people in this field do combinatorial chemistry and high school pro drug screening. They're, they're just combinatorial, try, try and error, right? Making this, making that, and cooking just like a, like a, like a cook, right? We're, we're just trying to see whether it have effect. But simulation does reveal the mechanism, right? Tell us why. Tell us the rules, revealing the rules behind this, how they're 
you know, by, by mapping on the energy, which is we, we have the computational tool to do that, to do that, that will help us uh, greatly reduce the time that's needed to, to uh, uh, for the drug innovation, all right? So there's a lot of uh, open question, of course, in this area, right? There's a multi-scale from uh, all atom simulation to theoretical model in the core screen MD. Actually, this is one of my proposals that I'm writing, right? I'm proposing this, a lot of open question in the field, right? So modeling and simulation facilitates screening, assessment, design, optimization of synthetic antibiotic. Anyway, so this is a, 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 a new thing. Let me, how am I doing time? So, okay, let me just conclude my talk today by uh, summar summarizing. Okay, so rapid advanced experimental computational tools as well as unprecedented bioimaging techniques that are facilitating quantitative mechanics-based model of cell nanomaterial interaction. Okay, as I showed this bioimaging techniques, even five years ago, lots of questions we were even possible to begin to, 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 uh, to explore, right, to study, because not biology so far has been qualitative, not quantitative, but with high resolution bioimaging techniques, biology started to be more and more quantitative. Right? This is where engineering can make a closer bridge with uh, uh, some of the biological problems. And, and I show three problems today as a representative examples of a uh, study conducted my group. And the first uh, example I gave it is the morphology of cell nanomaterial interactions. Okay, here I show that 1D nanomaterial below a critical diameter intercells while tip first entry pathway leading to a pathogenicity mechanism for CNT and asbestos nanofibers, right? This is because there's a critical size in fibers. Below that size, cell only interact with the tip, which is very dangerous, <laughs> okay? Cell only capture tip, so this material cell gets stuck, right? stuck in the, in the endocytosis, uh, get frustrated. So the second example I gave the study on vesicle packaging of flexible nanofibers here, the key concept is bio-stiff versus bio-soft. So when you say biology is soft, but how soft is really soft, right? So we give example. We, we give a concrete criteria, right, which is for fiber. For fiber, if the fiber undergo 20 piconewton, it buckle, then it's bio-soft. Okay? We are very quantitative here. Okay, uh, so it shows the persistent tip contact can damage lipid membrane, leading to cytotoxicity. We develop a mechanics-based cytotoxic phase diagram, and, and uh, we validate it by experiments to distinguish between pathogenic and biocompatible uh, behavior for carbon 1D nanomaterial. But anyways, but this one is not limited to carbon 1D material. It can be extended to all the other uh, different type of nanomaterial. The third uh, study I showed is on energy mapping of nanomaterial penetrating the cell membrane. Okay, here uh, the example is uh, how this kind of work help us develop a new antibiotic, right? As our, our paper just published shows, indeed, we were able to identify these two uh, very promising, highly promising compounds that can kill bacteria, even though we, are, we still do not fully understand the physics behind it, right? But so we're working with our colleagues on this. So thank you very much. Let me stop here. Thank you. They're different structure, That's, which, is, which is important. Therapeutically, how much can you give a patient that has an infection? Yeah, so, so, so the criteria is to have a very low accept, acceptable toxicity to the human cell, but enough to kill the sufficient to kill bacteria. So these two combines shows uh, seem to meet that criteria. But so far, it's still lots of things are not fully under, understood. A lot of physics, even though we're doing a combination of a combinatorial chemistry, try different things, 
and see how it works, right? So, th so there's a lot of work to be done. It's not fully understood yet. Thank you. Yeah. You said that you uh, do simulations at different levels of scale, one particularly was more Latin versus a more coarse grained version. Of right, right, right. Well, what I showed simulation today mostly are full atom, yeah. mostly full atom simulation. Oh, coarse grain, yeah, yeah, yeah. Depends on, right, because a full atom simulation is very expensive, right? Very expensive. But for example, one of the things is a coarse grain I showed today. Uh, yeah, these things are all full atom. But one thing, the coarse grain, this is a coarse grain. This, right? We're trying to simulate the interaction between a bilayer and a, and a carbon nanotube. So the deformation is actually large scale, large scale. So it depends on the scale of interest, because in order to model all the atoms, then it's too expensive to do this. So the core screening depends on the problem, I would say. Right? If you are interested in problems, looking at the morphology, looking at a, a, a configuration of, uh, from a physical point of view, uh, some core screening necessary. But if you look at the molecular interactions, if you're focused on the energy mapping, how a single molecule goes into cell membrane, then the full atom simulation is, is useful. When you're doing the coarse grain, do you actually figure out how the coarse grain is from the individual atom simulation? Right, 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 right. Parts of atoms and going to a higher level scale. Right, there's a various level of coarse grain. Uh, essentially, essentially is you're, you're condense a cluster of atoms into one particle, right? Then you try to capture the energy, uh, energetic evolution. From, from energy point of view, you're trying to make them a more or less equivalent, right? From free energy point of view, just like our our model, you can say is ultimate core screening in our model, <laughs> right? We condense into one parameter. Now, this is actually an awfully uh, uh, complex problem if you do a, a atomic simulation. So we just condense into into uh, energy functions, right? Uh, given a single parameter, this is like ultimate core screening, <laughs> right? You reduce the degree from into one. You talked about the length. What about the, the geometry of the point at the end? How is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you mean the tip here, right? Yeah. Right. The, the tip here, so, so in this particular example, when I copy it here, we're showing the tip is always wrapped tip. So as the, as the, uh, the, the fiber changes different orientation, that tip is always being fully wrapped. Right, so the fully, so they, they don't come into this free energy function of tip because they're always covered, right? But in the initial stage, they play, they do play a very important role. Right? Let's say a, a particle just first touch the cell, then it start become important role. I also publish a paper in those, in those uh, study initial stage of interaction. So the geometry, they play, the tip geometry are important at different stages. Once the fiber is in or they're already, they, they, they don't influence energy. But the initial stage is actually pretty dominant. I, I just didn't have time to touch this question. I gave a, this out in my one of the examples I gave. But they're important, very important, but not important in this question. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, there was going to be a lot of research involving bacteria in order to see how uranium and Biotics, but I was wondering if this could also be applicable to other areas, like other kind of uh, uh, sicknesses, like for example, cancer or even yeah. maybe viruses. Could this also apply to that? Yes, yes. If right now, a lot of people are actually using nanoparticle uh, to do cancer diagnostic, for example, right? Because the cancer cell membrane also have different characteristic compared to normal membrane. There's a lot of receptors. They have different electromagnetic properties. So you have the nanoparticle can code in this cancer cell. It's very important for diagnostic. Right. So nanoparticle actually, so I just didn't give an example here because uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of people in the community who do those, who do those things. Cancer treatment is one of the very important application area for nano, nanomaterials. It's a related wonderful talk, by the way. I was Thank just wondering, you. So, so are you sure there's no Uh, sorry, sorry. I wonder why the antibiotics which are really 
not toxic or, or less, much less toxic in human membranes. Oh, so yeah, yeah, all right, right, right. Very good question. Yeah, I didn't have time to discuss human that. Bacteria. Human bacteria, human membrane, the bacterial membrane, they have different compositions, yeah. right? So, so bacterial membrane have different lipids. Uh, sure. Human membrane, for example, have cholesterol, have many other, so they're, they're completely different. So we did, when we did the same calculation for human membrane, okay, and this free energy mapping, right? If you consider human membrane composition, they're completely changed. So have you guys done the experiment where you don't take an actual living bacteria or the living thing itself, but you just make you know, vesicles which have the composition, you know, the body, let's say, preserving it in the vitro and see if it works experimentally? We have done some work, but not complete. Because they want to do this, this receptor and some stuff, yes. right? That's right. right. That's right. No, we, we have not completed. This is just beginning. We have there's so much open questions, so many open questions. It's amazing. Right, right, right. right. Yes, yes, yes. A lot, lot of things worth, worth looking into further. Yes. So, you know, we talked about this binding game, which is now nanoparticles. Oh, one these. Right, right. I'm just following the, the community. So, so what we call one-dimensional material is uh, uh, they're, they're, one, di one dimension is, is uh, dominant, they're long, fibers, sorry, they will call it 1D. If it's uh, uh, 2D, that means two of the dimensions are long, like a sheet, right? <laughs> we call it 2D material. So like a plane, right? You look at plane. The thickness is given, thickness is prescribed, but, but the, the other two dimensions, you can, you can, you can design it. Like one day you can design the lens, but the cross section pretty much it can still be tuned to some extent, but pretty much it's clear, right? But the other dimension you can play with, right? So this is this is like jargon used in that nanomaterial community. Oh yeah, yeah, they're 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 they're, they're just a subfamily of one D material, right? Well, but they're very important actually in this way, in the flexibility. Single wall and multiply very different flexibility, right? So, yeah. So, anyway. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for your talk. I have a question on this slide. I mean, when this cell, so the rate curve is for the cell which burst, right? Yeah. Okay, so why it goes to minimum and then goes back up? Like, when it hits the minimum, is that the point when the cell bursts? Right. This minimum here corresponds to. This is from center, right? Corresponding some, some place like here. That means when this particle goes in, this is the minimum energy state, not right in the center. Right, right, right in the center of the cell, because this is bilayer, it's bilayer. Right in the center is a hydrophobic region here, but that's the high energy point. The low, lowest energy is right in the middle here. <laughs> so oh, okay. Why the burst is a very good question. I didn't quite address that, right? It's amazing that. The energy mapping, this entry pathway, already reflect the, uh, the, uh, the their, their consequence, right? Whether the birds or the cyclopean, that's the open question we're trying to investigate. That requires some you know, more bigger scale modeling. For example, we use free energy based modeling to model the aggregation or deformation, how they pour, how they, uh, how the memory develop pores. So that, that's, that this, is, uh, this is a completely open field, completely open field, right? And we're, we do not fully understand how this vessel burst, okay? Even without antibiotic, <laughs> even without antibiotic, how the pores form, a pore formation, the, the, the rupture of the membrane, it's a lot of people are working on this. But here we say they're highly sensitive to the nano, part, nanomaterials. If you put different materials, you can cause the membrane to destroy a membrane, you can keep an impact, you can cause the leakage. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of biophysics that needs to be explored. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, bacteria will eventually form a mechanical resistance to this, like, kind of like uh, chemical resistance to other antibiotics? Um, yeah. So, so, uh, <coughs> so the thing we, we see here, we, we, uh, we put them together in 100 days, we do not see a clear uh, increase in resistance. 
But we do see, you can see the slightly, well, of course on this scale, right, it's almost flat, but there's a slightly increase in resistance. What we found amazingly, the, the, cell, the bacterial cell membrane become more negative charged over time. Okay, so I think the bacteria is trying to, trying to, trying to develop some resistance, but not so successful yet. So we don't know if it's long enough, maybe there's, it, 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 it completely changed the composition. Could be right. Bacteria learn how to put some other molecule in and uh, change this energy energy mapping. But so far, uh, we don't know yet. This is a good question. But they do become a more electrically negative, more negative charge. Right? They, they they change our energy interaction a little bit, but not sufficient enough to develop substantial resistance. Yeah. So they're trying to do something. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, evolution is a strong force. <laughs> it's a very strong force. Yeah. We don't know what, it, what eventually it leads to, but uh, it's certainly a uh, lot of interesting open questions. Okay, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, some slides ago that uh, sometimes when, when cells absorb some of those nanomaterials that they ask for the help of other uh, um, immune cells in order to, to take care of, of that nanomaterial. Uh -huh. Is it possible to actually trigger an immune response by using nanomaterials that get stuck in the, in the, oh, yeah, the yeah. membrane of certain cells? Right. So, so th this case, right, the frustrated endocytosis is a trigger to the immune response, where it should not, right? Because there's no, because what cell, what the immune cell does is trying to clean all the dead cells, bacteria, all the foreign substances away from the body, clean them up, right? In our body, one billion cells die each day, right? So the immune cell are always working very hard, right? So, but if, if it gets stuck like this, it triggers a, a great immune response for no reason, for no good purpose, because our immune response cannot kill this, no matter what you do, right? So this immune response is unnecessary, and this leads to problems, right? You've got a, like a permanent inflammation somewhere in your body. <laughs> All right, so this is what the problem it triggers a lot of the uh, mutation, a lot of other things, problems, right? So the fibers are pretty dangerous to our body in that sense. We gotta be very careful. So I, I was thinking about like uh, maybe uh, implanting of one of these uh, nanometers into some foreign cell, I don't know, maybe a cancer cell, and the cancer cell might not absorb it, but the immune system might detect it. And oh. And trigger an immune response and try to Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's going to actually swallow the whole cancer cells. Oh, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. You know, the immunotherapy just won Nobel Prize two days ago, right? This is a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a great idea. Maybe nanomedicine can further advance that field as well. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't thought about that <laughs> so far. Yeah. It's a great idea. Yes. In the industry, uh, in occupational exposures to nanofibers, especially those biologically long, biologically stiff ones, has right. there been an increase in the presentation of disease? You know. Or uh, sorry, I, I didn't capture your, your beginning of your. Has there been season. an increase in disease and occupational exposures? Right. Using nanofibers. Right, right, right. And oh, in occupation, asbestos is one a prominent asbestos example. Asbestos is one, but it, what about the new? They're using a lot of new ones. Right, a lot of new ones. I don't think there's enough data. FDA, the FDA regulation on the nanomaterial currently focus on chemistry. They haven't focused on mechanical aspect because there's not enough data there. All right, right. So far, they they say this is toxic. This is not toxic. It's mostly, almost always, based on chemistry, based on the, the chemical composition. But the uh, the mecha mechanistic effect start. People start to recognize that. Right, but haven't haven't been to the FDA regulation yet. Important uh, work then. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>